I'm Carol Werner. I'm the Executive Director for the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. And on behalf of E for the Future and EESI, we are so glad to welcome you to this briefing this afternoon to talk about energy efficiency, America's job creation powerhouse. We think that there is such an exciting story to tell here that many times many of us are really not aware of what really is involved, what is really happening. We are clearly seeing shifts in our economy and in our jobs, and this is true across the country. And we think that it's really important to take a look at what the story is uh, to really develop to uh, uh, the opportunity to, to look at numbers, but to look behind the numbers and to look at what really is going on. What are the stories that we are seeing behind those numbers and what does this mean across our whole country? Uh, how pervasive is this? Is, is what we're seeing with regard to job shifting? What's happening in terms of this whole sector? Is it located in just certain states? Is it in certain cities? How broadly across the spectrum is it? And we're going to really take some deeper dives into those issues this afternoon. We have a wonderful panel that will lead us through that uh, to talk about that and what we really are learning. Uh, it's a chance for us to really ask questions about what, uh, what does this really mean? What do we expect? Um, is this whole area, is this now set to grow further? Um, are there things that are needed in order for that to further happen? Um, and it's a chance to really ask people who are up to their eyeballs in this whole issue. So to kick off our panel this afternoon, um, it, it turns out that in terms of looking at these kinds of analyses, you've got to have somebody who's doing that first work, that research, really um, putting together the analysis. And the, the work that has been done in terms of this whole study that was commissioned by E for the Future and Environmental Entrepreneurs uh, has the lead on this is Phil Jordan who is both the Vice President for BW Research Partnership as well as the Executive Director of the Economic Advancement Research Institute. And I think one of the things that is also important is that the analysis that he has done with regard to this study has also been done by another study uh, that you will also hear about um, uh, on this panel that was uh, done through the National Association of State Energy Officials. But Phil has authored many reports, uh, including things taking a look at the national solar labor market, looking at regional uh, renewable energy and green uh, construction analyses, as well as looking at industry clusters uh, from healthcare to other kinds of technology. And I think one of the things that he also brings to this important work is that he previously had served as the director of the San Diego and Imperial Region uh, Center of Excellence, where he provided training and skill gap analysis to nine community colleges in his region. And I think as we look at this whole area that we're going to find that community colleges play an enormous role across the country with regard to thinking about jobs, job opportunities in these really important clean energy sectors that have been really coming on strong. So at this point, I want to turn to Phil to walk us through the analysis. Thanks. Great, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for having me here to talk about uh, this important work and this important study. Um, we are going to talk about energy efficiency jobs uh, and how they are a job creation powerhouse. And I would like to get into a little bit, uh, a little bit of information about the training, the types of people who have these jobs, and the sort of things that we can do to make sure that the businesses, uh, one of one of which is represented on our, on our panel here, um, can actually find the workers that they need in their local communities because these jobs are highly local. Um, but first, I'm going to start with everyone's favorite topic, which is methodology. Um, I'm going to sort of give a high level, but if anybody's interested in sort of digging deep on um, margins of error or other sorts of uh, statistical questions, I'm happy to do that. Um, but I did want to just sort of note that um, the baseline data that's used to produce 
um, this report for E for the Future and E2 um, is really comprehensive. It's based on uh, data that's collected um, that, that we produce for the U.S. Energy and Employment Report. Um, which uh, the genesis of which was in the Department of Energy starting in 2016. Um, that is a very large um, survey, supplemental survey of about 30,000 businesses each year. We're in the fourth year of conducting that research currently. Um, it includes more than a dozen federal data sets. Uh, the methodology and results were thoroughly reviewed by the uh, Energy Inf Information Administration, by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, by external peer reviewers, um, so much so that um, actually the research was cited by um, President Obama in his article for Science Magazine in 2017. So that's to say, you know, I'm going to talk a lot about figures and numbers, and a lot of people ask the question, you know, how do I know that these numbers are okay? And, you know, it's not just me telling you that, you know, we did this work. It's been very thoroughly vetted by a number of federal agencies and external peer reviewers in academia um, and the business community. Um, I think something that, that we really tried to do is to make sure that we had information that was useful um, so we could understand all the different energy technologies, really ranging from, from fossil fuel generation, um, extraction, production, to you know, the, the early stage uh, research and development for the storage sector, to you know, really the full value chain of energy efficiency and, and products that save energy, um, as well as some transportation work as well. And to make that really valuable, it has to be really granular. We need to differentiate between the types of jobs that are working in warehouses versus working in manufacturing facilities versus in the field doing installation in the construction sector. Um, it also has to really be specific by location because so many of these jobs are highly local. And so what you'll see if you go through the report and the, uh, and the materials, um, really highly granular local data on how many jobs there are and what those jobs are doing. So those are sort of the keys to the, the methodology here. Um, just a few key findings that I'll run through with you. Um, first of all, uh, two and a quarter million energy efficiency jobs across the United States. That's, that's really big. Um, it's larger than any of the, the quote unquote clean energy sector. So it's significantly bigger than the solar sector, significantly bigger than wind, actually significantly bigger than all renewables combined. Um, so energy efficiency is a lot of jobs. Um, and not surprisingly, a huge number of these jobs are found in the construction sector. So we're going to hear from an employer today on the panel who's going to talk more about what those types of jobs are in the construction sector. But for those of you who I think all of you in this room probably have highly local interests, um, construction jobs do tend to be highly local. Um, they do tend to be highly accessible jobs. Um, and so um, what we're really talking about are a lot of um, uh, local, non-outsourceable, non-automatable jobs that have good, steady, long career pathways. And we'll, we'll get into that, I think, a little bit later in the panel. Um, uh, HVAC is a big segment of energy efficiency work, so it's the largest of all the segments. So HVAC and building envelope are the two really, really big um, elements. And then, as I mentioned, you know, significant jobs in all, in all 50 states. When we look at um, the various uh, value chain segments, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide, but you can see that we do look all across uh, manufacturing and wholesale trade and distribution. Um, also professional and business services, so these are things like architects and engineers um, who are designing, for example, um, LEED uh, certified buildings um, or other types of, of, of building products. Um, also in includes many of the early stage research and development uh, uh, companies as well. A few more highlights that we thought were sort of important. Um, uh, almost every county in the U.S. we found energy efficiency jobs. Um, so 99.7% of U.S. counties have energy efficiency workers in them. Um, as I mentioned, these are highly local. Um, and, um, you know, that translates to 3,000. So there's only seven counties in the U.S. that don't have any energy efficiency workers. Um, I, I can't tell you which ones they are off the top of my head. Um, but if you give me a, a little while, I could. Um, there are a few areas that we really also wanted to look into for, for geographic uh, understanding. And we found 300,000 Americans living in rural areas working in energy efficiency. So this was, we thought, something that was really important because we wanted to say, you know, is this something that really only focuses around cities or only around the suburbs? And what we found is actually a uh, good distribution across, um, 
across you know rural America as well as uh, as well as um, in the in the metropolitan areas. Um, uh, energy efficiency workers are about a third, a little more than a third of all U.S. energy workers, um, if you combine all the different categories. Um, and um, these are largely small businesses, right? So a lot of small businesses. So we talk a lot about energy efficiency, but what you see is almost half of energy efficiency companies in the United States have five or fewer employees, right? So um, this work that's being done um, is, is really driving small businesses and small business growth. And we see 9% uh, growth in jobs. So that's, you know, I mean, job growth has been, has been quite good um, over the last couple of years, but 9% is really, is, is what we would sort of refer to as gazelle type growth. It's a very, very rapid growth. And for an industry of this size, that's really, um, that's really something. Um, employers are optimistic, so the percentages that you see here are not, you know, economist projections, like I look at a bunch of data and tell you what I think is going to happen. This is based on what employers reported they expected to happen over a 12-month period. So rather than thinking of it as, you know, this is a, you know, a guaranteed number that somebody's taking the reputation on, what it's really to look at is optimism, right? And so um, if you see those numbers start to tank, then you start saying, uh oh, employers are a little, getting a little bit concerned. Or if you see them really, really big, then you say, boy, they really expect some things to happen um, in the future. So, um, you know, there's, there's good news in the optimism there. Uh, you know, briefly, we do look at some larger occupational categories, um, and really the takeaway here is that um, there are jobs for, for all different types of workers, um, and, you know, this is not just, um, not just for the construction uh, trade jobs. There's also many other jobs in sales. There are jobs um, in administrative positions, management, and other professional positions. Um, so lots of different opportunities that exist from an occupational perspective. Um, and then uh, we look at, at demographics as well, um, and these are, um, we look at a variety of, of measures here for um, different race and ethnicity uh, and gender categories. We use the same categories as the, as the uh, Census Bureau, so, you know, a lot of times people ask, well, you know, how do these numbers add up? This is the way that the U.S. government does it, so we follow suit. Um, and uh, there's been a lot in the news there. You know, some takeaways here, I mean, obviously, still a highly male-dominated workforce. Not surprising given the number of jobs in construction, which is historically a male-dominated industry. Um, but also, um, I think uh, the research suggests there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, the other area that I would just sort of point out as being particularly underrepresented in the data, where there's a lot of work that can be done, is for black or African-American workers. Um, not as represented as they are in the overall economy, and again, something um, for us to think about. Um, so again, as we think about the various um, uh, people working in the sector, these are just some things that we like to track over time to see if there are any changes. Um, one thing that we know for sure in looking at Generation Z, which by the way, millennials, if maybe, maybe some millennials in the room it looks like, um, millennials are sort of becoming old news for employers. Everyone's looking at Gen Z now, right? These are the the um, 22 and under crowd, um, and they are very different. Gen Z is very different uh, than millennials, um, and there's two sort of key characteristics that we see in the research. One is that it is the most diverse generation in American history, right? So um, uh, if, you, if the industries are not attracting a diverse workforce, they're going to struggle to find talent because they are, are, it is just a much more diverse uh, generation. Um, and also, something that really matters to this generation more so than millennials is that the work that's provided is interesting. So um, the millennial generation is known for wanting to have sort of the work for a company that provides a great social impact or something like that, whereas a Gen Z really wants to know that the work that they're doing is interesting. And so this is based on some, some other survey work that we've done. So just some interesting factors, important to track demographics so that we know that we're matching supply and demand. Um, and then finally, I will just say that, um, um, you know, the takeaway, right, for me when people say, what's the big finding here, right, more energy efficiency uh, work means more construction jobs. That is the primary beneficiary of the industry. Um, that is the, this is a deployment-driven industry, so most of the jobs are actually working with, installing, creating, um, and, uh, and, and um, actually directly installing or maintaining or repairing these positions. Um, and, um, and this number, we track this intensity of how much time they spend. 
the industry, the construction industry, is actually spending more and more time every year working with energy efficiency products. So what that means is that we see these changes happening. We see lots of sort of general job growth. We see lots of growth in the construction sector generally. We're seeing even faster growth in energy efficiency jobs within construction. Um, and we see an even greater share of the work being done in the construction sector with energy efficiency. And I think if you talk to these employers, and we did, they will tell you they are having a desperately hard time finding talent. There is an enormous opportunity for people who are looking for work to do construction work connected to energy efficiency, and I think we'll hear more about that going forward. So um, that is all the remarks that I have, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have at the end. That's okay, Pat. You can come right up, okay? Um, thanks, thanks so much, Phil. And it's really, really interesting and fascinating to hear sort of some of the things that you have, uh, have found there. And I really look forward to our having a discussion in terms of thinking about this, also this kind of gap in terms of what you were indicating was that while there has been terrific growth, there is the opportunity for a ton more growth if there was, if there was more capacity or, you know, more people in the workforce. So um, that will be something great for us to talk about further. So now to really start to get behind this, what is that, uh, what is the, the story uh, behind energy efficiency? And to put a face on this whole thing, we're going to turn to Pat Stanton, who is the Director of Policy for E for the Future. And of course, the E for the Future is uh, sponsoring, co-sponsoring with us in terms of this important briefing. And Pat has been laboring in the vineyards of this whole area for, for many years and is um, well recognized nationally for all of her work in regulatory policy analysis and advocacy uh, related to efficiency, to renewables, and the whole range of demand resources. Uh, she is leading the faces of EE campaign, and prior to her work uh, at E for the Future, she was the policy she was the policy advocacy lead for CSG, and also led a consulting service for clean energy markets participants. And back before that, and I think that this also is an important piece of the important contribution that Pat brings is that she had also been the Deputy Commissioner for the Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources and had also been involved in uh, working on waste prevention as well as on water supply issues. So she's always looked at things in a very holistic way and in terms of sort of bringing these things together and always looking to get behind, uh, to tell that story that is behind the numbers. Pat? Thank you so much. So, um, Phil, I hope convinced you that the numbers are sound, that they're, we've been doing this research over and over and we've got good sound numbers, but this is complicated. This is, it's a diverse workforce and it's hard to explain. It's, many of the people in the workforce don't even identify themselves as being energy efficiency workers. They identify themselves as, you know, working for, um, uh, you know, working for corning making insulation. I work in a factory. And I, they don't consider themselves uh, an energy efficiency worker. So one of the things we've been looking to do is really try and develop engaging and accessible materials that can help tell the story. And as my uh, head of communications always tells me there's nothing like looking at the a face of another person to engage people. So we've developed the Faces of EE campaign and we hope you will be seeing it uh, around. The other thing is infographics and we certainly work very hard with Phil's team to have good infographics this year and we feel um, that we've distilled down what was uh, in the previous year a pretty long pretty wordy report into something that is really uh, engaging and accessible. That's what we've really tried to do. Um, we'd love your feedback. We'd always want to make it more accessible. Um, and so the entire report uh, summarizing uh, many of the things that Phil mentioned is only four pages long. Lots of 
you know, lots of graphics, lots of, so you can really uh, get the, the basics in a quick package. The best news, though, for uh, being here in Congress is that there's a four-page sheet for each state. And I'm just going to go through that uh, quickly to give you an idea of, of what kind of information is available for uh, your state. And so, um, as an example, of, we have Ohio, and um, we have, uh, for these state sheets, we've compressed some of the pie pieces, merged some of the pie pieces to try and make things, again, simpler, more, more uh, engaged, more accessible. Um, I just want to be very clear that it's, actu it's all the same numbers. It's just instead of you know, six or eight pie pieces, it's just the four to try and uh, really get to the essence uh, and be able to communicate clearly. Um, and then we also have pulled out the top t some top talking points that we think you might find really interesting. Certainly the construction jobs, and depending on what state you're in, 20% uh, of all construction jobs have the construction workers spending more than 50% of their time on energy efficiency. That's a lot of jobs in Ohio. And it's a big piece of the energy sector. It's a quarter of the energy sector of all the jobs in Ohio. And also, the average number of veterans in the workforce, the av average percent of, uh, of veterans in the workforce is uh, 6%. And here we have 10% of all of the workers uh, holding jobs in energy efficiency in Ohio are veterans. So it's a work, it's a, a field that is open and welcoming to our veterans. Um, Phil already mentioned really small businesses. We're not talking small business as defined by federal law. We're talking five people, six to ten to twenty people, really small, very local businesses. Great opportunities for people to start their own businesses. And uh, we've connected on the state sheet at, with uh, one of our faces of EE so that you can uh, connect with our materials and understand that, that these are real people. Also, uh, for each state, we have the state upper house and the state lower house with all of the um, numbers of jobs in those districts. And just to go back, I almost forgot, we also have all of the congressional districts. So the numbers of jobs in your uh, congressional district, you can just look them up right there. And we have these heat maps. Now, this is uh, based on the number of energy efficiency workers per thousand workers. And it's not, you know, 17 per thousand. It's still pretty small. But what's really interesting is it's not all in one place. It's really spread out throughout the state. There are some places sort of in the northwest of, um, of uh, Ohio where we have some manufacturing. Uh, John Manville uh, has, a, pardon? No, it's, it's, it's John Manville has some uh, in, in, uh, insulation manufacturing. Um, so, um, and we have, uh, cr we have uh, faces of EE in every state. Uh, we've collected uh, representatives uh, from, rep from the workforce and gotten their images and their uh, store, a little bit of their story. And we've created it uh, in a uh, social media uh, way. And we, we are happy to work with folks to um, advertise events or, or whatever. Um, we also have collateral handout materials that show uh, the range of the workforce in each state. And these are the numbers. Right now, we still have Nebraska. We do have one in Nebraska. It took us a while. Um, we're looking, uh, we're going to be doing a, a major a photo shoot in a couple of weeks in, Ohio, uh, in Illinois. 
um, and we're hoping to pick up some more uh, faces out in the, uh, in the West. We have on our website, you can download all of these materials for your state. Um, so please uh, feel free to come and get those materials. And um, what we want to do, wanted to do, is create engaging, interesting materials that would generate questions so that you would come back to us and ask questions. And we can dig in. And we have already, on a couple of occasions, uh, said, wow, what's, why is there that dark, dark spot on the map in you know, Michigan's Upper Peninsula? And we've gone back to BW's team, and we've been able to get the answer to that kind of question. So we want to uh, be a resource. Uh, with our partner, uh, our E2 partner, uh, to uh, answer those kind of more detailed questions. So we've prepared materials that are, you know, m not in great detail, but hopefully are engaging and will uh, generate questions. Um, and uh, we've provided all contact information um, so that you can reach us. It's always important to put things in context and to figure out sort of once you take the the data where does where does it go and um, and, and so now uh, to tell a little bit more of that story we're going to turn to David Terry who is the executive director for the National Association of State Energy Officials or as we all say NASIO and uh, David uh, and I have known each other ever since uh, he first uh, went to NASIO back in 1996. And he has worked in a variety of capacities and, is, and has been uh, leading uh, NASIO for, for many years. And, is, uh, and in terms of thinking about the whole role of NASIO, all of the issues that state energy uh, officials and that those offices ca um, cover uh, across the country is really a pretty remarkable breadth of issues that those offices must deal with everything from energy assurance to thinking about about jobs uh, how to fill gaps what's the situation with regard to energy supply um, who really exists in different fields uh, and there are uh, Inasios membership does therefore involve 56 state and territory energy offices. And David works with all of those um, with regard to looking at all sorts of national energy issues, communicating on behalf of that whole diverse group uh, to the federal government, to Congress, and to, to DOE and other agencies, covering electricity policy, energy efficiency, market transformation, renewable energy, commercialization, and deployment all sorts of efficiency issues across the sectors, whether it's residential, commercial, industrial, uh, transportation, uh, as well as, like I mentioned, energy assurance and reliability. And so David has been working with these issues with so many different players for so many years. And furthermore, NASIO was involved also working with uh, with Phil in terms of a report that was released back in May that is very complementary to this E for the Future and E2 report. Uh, and that report, which I said uh, was released in May, looks uh, across the overall energy sector and once again provides us some important context. David. Thanks, Carol, and thanks uh, for being here today. I'm going to, uh, that was a good segue, I think, uh, at the beginning of your remarks of, so we have the data and we have the analysis, what do we do with it? And I think just a couple of, a couple of maybe opening comments. First of all, just the work that Carol and EESI do to inform the state energy directors around the country. As she mentioned, we represent all 56 governors, energy directors, and there are some uh, 3,000 odd staff, uh, professional staff in different offices covering every energy sector from uh, uh, oil, natural gas, electricity, a lot of efficiency, renewables, et cetera. And, and it's been invaluable. And as has the partnership we have with BW Research on the jobs data, um, as, as Pat Stanton can attest, being a former state official, um, the states lobbed some pretty tough questions at Phil and his team on jobs um, and came away with 
the, the sense that, wow, these are really accurate, solid numbers. Um, they have stood the test of time with our members, so just, uh, uh, just to kind of reiterate that. And also with uh, E for the Future and the analytical work they've done with this, when Pat brought some of the state level information to our board, which includes 20 states from around the country, um, literally they lit up. This is the kind of analytical work they need and information they need about jobs um, in every sector, but particularly the efficiency sector, and this is just of huge value. And I'd like to just spend a few minutes talking a little bit about why um, the data matters from a state perspective, why it should matter to all of you here um, uh, in an environment where we have 3.8% unemployment, and a little bit about um, how states uh, are using it and uh, how they're making the data really come to life, and then a few additional thoughts that maybe are a little bit more forward-looking. But uh, starting with the why, you know, the, not every community has full employment, obviously, but I think the bigger issue is um, really twofold. One, many, many people, as you know, are underemployed um, and need to uh, acquire additional skills and move up the skills ladder. Uh, two, we have so many uh, companies that are in need of employees in the energy space especially, and in the efficiency space especially, that don't have enough skilled workers. It's an economic development limiting factor for states. So this is huge, hugely important. Um, as an example of that, in the energy savings performance contracting area, which is sort of for public sector buildings, efficiency retrofits, it's about a five or six billion dollar a year industry at the state and local level. Um, the industry thinks it should be triple that. There are two big limiting factors. One are uh, time available to state and local officials to make it happen from a policy perspective, but it's not money, it's workforce, the lack of workforce. So taking this data, particularly in the efficiency sector, across uh, whether it's trade jobs, apprenticeships, community college, uh, engineering skills, in every way, the states, through their governor's priorities, through federal funds, through state appropriations, through especially public-private partnerships, they need to know where to target those dollars. Where are, they, where are the priority industries? Where are we employing the most people? What's the biggest value add? So the, without the jobs data that come from these types of studies, um, especially in the efficiency space, there's not a good way to allocate those funds in a, in a fully informed manner. So really, in the last few years, uh, with this data, it's the first time we've had that. Uh, so I think that's a, a great driver. The other one that's a little bit longer term is the, the market, the energy markets are in a huge transformational period. We have uh, really a, uh, a transformation in the electric sector and the natural gas sector, how energy is used in buildings, uh, efficiency technologies, all of these coming together and they require new workforce skills. And again, I think the great thing about the efficiency jobs and the message that we've gotten from the data and research that the states are using, it's at every, every level of education from PhDs um, to the important trade positions uh, and many of the construction jobs, they all matter. So uh, it also really informs the states about how they go forward. And when they're looking further ahead, the other thing our, our energy uh, directors are engaged in is state energy planning. So they work with their governors, 42 of the states carry out energy policy plans for their governors. So new governors elected, this is a big election coming up, we'll have probably 20 new governors, uh, give or take. Uh, the energy directors will be tasked with doing new energy policies for the states that partly reflect the governor's priorities certainly, but also the stakeholders, the communities, that are there. Having the jobs data uh, behind that to help determine what's a priority, uh, what's the value of efficiency jobs, what's the value of other jobs in energy, and how should uh, workforce development dollars be targeted. Um, highly relevant. It matters to the state. Governors like to get things accomplished. They like to have economic, uh, economic growth, obviously sustained, but also uh, workforce, uh, wage data, wage growth, etc. So being able to plug this information to those plans is something that's already underway. That's what's been happening with this data. Um, the faces of efficiency that Pat brought in helped to make that case. It's not, it's not just advocacy. It's making it real for the people that are allocating those dollars. Um, and, and one other area I wanted to touch on, it is quite forward-looking, I suppose, but we're really on the cusp in this country of an artificial intelligence uh, uh, and big data boom, as well as things like autonomous vehicles. These are transforming jobs in almost every sector. We have to be thinking five, ten years out. The jobs data we have help to inform those decisions. Our energy director members are making those decisions now. They're thinking about the policies they put in place. Um, what are the positive and negative impacts? What are the transitions that they have to pay attention to? 
And I think the beauty of efficiency jobs in particular is, as, as Pat pointed out, you saw in that slide in Ohio, they're spread out through across the state. So there's a really robust opportunity, I think, for local officials, for state officials to put that data together and think about uh, its impact and what it, and what it means. Uh, lastly, I'd just like to give you a, a, a little sample from New York about how they're using this jobs data. And I could point to many other states, uh, California, um, Iowa, Florida, other states, they're using this jobs data in the efficiency area. But uh, recently, in the last couple of weeks, Governor Cuomo from Florida released his new clean energy jobs industry uh, report, which allocates $27.5 million across a number of workforce training uh, areas. That work was informed by this work, where they targeted those dollars in clean technology training centers. Um, in workforce training, in public-private partnerships, et cetera. Um, and so I think it's really a, a, a first uh, a close-up look of how the dollars get allocated and uh, doing it in an informed way, a way that really produces results, uh, produces hopefully uh, higher wage jobs, higher skill jobs over time. Um, and I think the beauty, again, of the efficiency sector is that that's really spread across every educational level, um, more age groups, and more parts of every state, which for a governor is pretty good news. Um, I'll stop there and happy to take questions later. Thanks. So what could be better than having somebody to talk to us this afternoon who's actually out there doing this stuff? And so I am delighted to be able to turn to uh, Ryan Weitzel, who is the Regional Director for FLC Energy. Uh, FLC is a home performance contractor which is working to make homes, small businesses more efficient, comfortable, and safe. And I think it's important for us to recognize that, th that there are all of these different factors that really come into um, uh, improving the overall quality of life when we start to address energy efficiency in, in homes and businesses. And so FLC is working with highly qualified and trained professionals uh, to create a really trusted brand known for providing uh, the very best service to homes and businesses in Maryland and Delaware. Uh, and they care deeply about making customer satisfaction uh, their top priority so that as they go through doing very comprehensive home assessments, doing evaluations in home performance services so that they are really delivering the right goods. So Ryan, what does this mean for you? Hi everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here today. It's really a pleasure. Uh, before I get started, I kind of want to talk about what energy efficiency means to me, um, how we operate within that realm. But I'd like to start out kind of with two questions. Um, can I get the show of hands by how many people actually live inside of a building? And how many people work inside of a building here? Yes, so energy efficiency does actually apply to you. Um, it's not it's not wholly about the, the numbers on um, using less energy. It is about, I think at its core, um, creating better buildings that can be a more energy efficient building, that can be a more comfort, uh, comfortable building, a healthier building. Um, it can be a building that lasts longer. It can be weather resistant barriers, things that shed water so the building uh, doesn't degrade over time. Um, in my field, home performance, we do energy audits. We um, deal with making homes more comfortable. Uh, but I think the bigger part of that is starting to be health and safety. Um, I would never lead in with energy efficiency being my, my selling tactic for a customer in the private market. Um, people are not interested in that. You're probably used to paying the same bill month to month year after year that you pay and the only time you ever notice it go up is mainly um, if there's a cost in like your kilowatt hour. Um, people are accustomed to those things. What, what they are kind of sick of, especially in existing homes, is uncomfortable properties and properties that make them, uh, I guess, take away their health. We spend about 96 percent of our time indoors and if you're in a house that has mold, mildew, lead, asbestos, um, just poor overall indoor air quality, if it's uncomfortable in different rooms, 
those are the things that really matter to people. And I think more and more, um, at least in the 13 years that I've been doing this, those are the things that people are starting to talk about. And that is the direction where I've seen growth in this industry, at least in the private market. Um, to speak to kind of what some of uh, our other panelists have talked about, the growth is there. Um, my business over the past year has swelled. Um, so much so where I, I can't actually get out to take care of the customers that, uh, that, are, that are calling me on a daily basis. Um, it's, it's a lack of education um, in the field, trying to get qualified people um, to, who, are, who are willing to work because, I mean, it's a, it's a tough job. Uh, depending upon where you're working in the country, you could be working in crawl spaces, you're always going to be working in attics. Um, it's hot, it's wet, it's cold, it's muggy, there are bugs, um, it's itchy, it's, I mean, it, it's, it's terrible work in, in some respects. I, you know, if you're, if you're in the trenches, it, it really is difficult. Um, and it's hard to see a light at the end of that tunnel. Where do you go from working in an attic eight, ten hours a day? How do you build upon that? Um, that, though, is the foundation to understanding how buildings work and ultimately how to make them better, how to retrofit them, how to make a better building right from the, uh, the sense of new construction. Um, the getting qualified candidates is very tough. Um, if, if, I, if I could find those people who are willing to do the job um, or even knew that it was in existence, um, that knew that it was a, a possibility, there's plenty of people who are willing to work hard. It's just a matter of do they even understand or have, a, uh, have any comprehension of, of what it is that you're doing. Um, I could probably hire, I have, I have eight people on staff right now. I could probably use two more people out in the field and one more person in the office. That's, that's right now. Um, and the ability to service more people, the ability to get more work done, to take on more calls, that leads to a, a business being able to grow. It's very difficult to have to push people out two months into December when they're calling you about an issue with comfort and say, hey, can you hold off until it's, the temperature drops 20 degrees? It's not what people want to hear. People want service now. Um, they want it yesterday in some cases. That's in the private market. I think that uh, in, the, in the work that we do for states, weatherization assistance programs, there's also significant room for growth there. I could have a crew that just worked on weatherization assistance, or possibly two, and then two or three that work in the private market. Um, weatherization assistance is important as well because not only does it provide these jobs for people, but the impact that it has for those in our community who, you know, are the neediest. Um, that's where the real benefit is for them. And that really is down to the energy savings. Um, weatherization assistance programs can reduce people's bills by 20, 30, 40, 50% in some cases. They do probably have the biggest impact on making homes healthier. Um, a lot of that work is done in um, mobile homes that are built before 1980. Um, sometimes you have three or four generations of families living in these properties. This could be a single wide home that might be 700, 900, if it's a double wide, 1,200 square feet, and you might have five, six, seven people living in, uh, in those properties. Um, they have significant issues, and it, it takes, uh, takes a lot of time and effort to, to kind of get them straight. But I think that uh, those who are most underserved and our communities benefit the most uh, through weatherization programs and through this industry as a whole. Um, in terms of, I guess that, one thing that I, that I do, I guess, want to hit on um, sort of in closing is, is energy efficiency, I think, is important because it is measurable. Um, when we go into a house and do an energy audit, I'm testing in, so I'm, I'm getting numbers from the house, how it is currently working, and then we're going to work, 
and then at the end of it, we're testing out, we're running the same pre-test that we ran, and we're just getting the difference. So what did we actually achieve in this house? You can measure things like our value of insulation, what you put into a wall, but it's the, the tools and equipment that you measure pressure and leakage with and the efficiency of systems uh, that ultimately really derive your savings. And uh, the ability to measure that, I think, is very important. There are very few things where you can, uh, you can actually look at an electric bill from month to month or year to year and say, our work that cost this much actually ended up saving this much. Um, I think that's, that's really important, and that is something that gets left in the, the weeds. To me, I, I, don't, I don't care. Um, like I said, I just want to make homes more comfortable and energy efficient for, or, or comfortable and safe for people. But those are numbers that you can actually attest to. Um, and um, I, was saying, I think it's uh, really all I, all I have got on that. Um, if you have more questions for me, please, um, if you have more questions on home performance and energy efficiency and what I do, Ask me. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much, Ryan. And our last uh, speaker the, this afternoon, before we open it up for um, our discussion with, with all of you, is Grant Carlisle, who is the Director of Advocacy for Environmental Entrepreneurs E2. And of course, it was E2 and E for the Future who have commissioned the, uh, this important efficiency report. And Grant leads the federal relations and coordination of state strategy efforts um, with, with national policy for environmental entrepreneurs. And he is working uh, to look at E2's priorities in clean energy, transportation, agriculture, and uh, other areas that E2 is focused on at the, at the federal level. He has been involved in environmental and technology issues for a number of years, both in uh, a private law firm as well as having also spent some time up here on the House side. So, Grant? Thank you very much. Thanks for having me and E2 here today. Uh, we're very, very happy that we were able to work with E4 the Future once again and Phil and BW Research uh, and Nacio to publish this work. Um, I will keep my comments brief because we've had four folks come up and talk about this information and I'm sure you're anxious to get to questions. Um, I just wanted to uh, highlight a few of the issues in the report we found most notable. Um, and I think that uh, Phil and probably everybody else has covered these, but we'll just hit them again real quick. Um, this is the most detailed report ever on U.S. energy efficiency employment. Um, that really is a profoundly important issue because this is two and a quarter million jobs spread out across the country. It's in almost every single county in the country. I'd actually like to know the counties that it's not present in. Uh, I assume they're in Alaska. Um, I'm not really sure. Um, but um, they are spread out across construction, innovation, um, engineering, and other fields. Um, they're in almost every congressional district, certainly every state. Um, and they uh, have an outsized impact on employment um, in, in a lot of communities um, because these are, you know, well-paying jobs and generally, and they're uh, jobs that are supplement, as Dave was pointing out, uh, the income of some people. So, you know, this is, they devote a certain percentage of their time to this. Maybe it's not the full percentage, but it helps get them across the line of not being underemployed. Um, one other thing I wanted to point out, I'm not sure if, if Phil did, because I think I missed the beginning of his, uh, but the amount of veterans that are in this field. Um, this is pretty true across a number of, um, you know, energy efficiency, solar and wind, but um, veterans are employed in a much larger amount than they are in the national economy and other fields, uh, which uh, I'm sure would be is a very important fact for your bosses as well. Um, let's see what else. And I know Phil covered these, but again, uh, just the amount of uh, folks working in the construction field in energy efficiency is, is really profound. Um, Energy policy, as I'm sure you're all aware, is one area that's uh, really intrinsically linked to policy because it is uh, 
because of the amount of investment that has to be made in any in any field, the structure of utility markets, you really do have to have policy leading at the federal and state level. So, um, you know, smart tax policies that encourage energy efficiency in new homes or retrofitting bu businesses, um, either at the federal or state level, um, policies that drive weather weatherization innovation, sort of like Ryan was talking about um, at the Department of Energy, for instance, are really profoundly important. Um, and so we've, you know, it's, it's pretty measurable to watch if you see um, a tax policy, for instance, that's helped energy efficiency in the past sunset or you see uh, a program get cut or, or a program come into use and expand. Um, that has an effect within, you know, a couple of years on these jobs, which is really, really important because, of course, they're spread out across the country in large numbers. And this is just an example. I know Pat really went into detail on this, but just looking at the state numbers, um, for Colorado, uh, for instance, we've had a lot of uh, several states like Colorado, uh, Pennsylvania as well, where you have really fast-growing urban, suburban, and exurban areas, and then uh, with a lot of new construction, and then completely rural areas with probably older homes, like Ryan was referring to, either mobile or other types of uh, structures that are being sort of like refurbished and renovated. Um, so it really, it's one of those sort of rare employment areas that applies to a lot of areas of a state, not just one certain community, um, which obviously has a, a really profound impact on the uh, employment of that state and, and those various communities. And then Virginia, we're just pointing out, um, and I know Phil went over this as well, um, uh, the veterans numbers and, and the sort of people that are employed in these, in these fields. And Pennsylvania, just uh, a color map. Uh, showing where they're focused. Again, uh, what I was sort of pointing out, you see in this bottom uh, right-hand corner, the, the southeast corner around Philadelphia, the southwest corner around Pittsburgh. You have a really high concentration of jobs, but you have it pretty, spread pretty evenly throughout most of the rest of the state as well, which is um, older homes that are being renovated. And that's it. I told you I'd be brief. So thanks to all of our panel for, uh, for presenting and for talking us through uh, both the report and kind of sort of the, some of the priority issues behind it. So let's open it up for your questions. And if you could just wait for a microphone to come to you so that people on the live cast can also hear. Um, do we have any questions or comments for any of our panel? So um, I'm a K-12 teacher that's doing a fellowship here, and I'm looking at the pipelines that you all are s telling us are empty. Um, you're not getting the workers you need. Um, I've heard this in several briefings over different um, manufacturers. So the K-12 scenario, the right before community college, because I heard someone say that community colleges were going to be a real important part, but um, also the recognition that the jobs aren't even recognized as jobs and as kids start to think in their high school, you know, late high school and even prior to that because you want someone to say when they're a fifth grader, I don't want, I want to be an astronaut, I want to be a fireman, I, I want to do something in energy, that doesn't come up very often. Mm -hmm. So where, is there a place that we could put um, effort in or it's being done? Can you talk to that a little bit? I I think I probably would like everybody to answer that question. Uh, and thank you. That's a really, really important um, comment. Go ahead. Yeah, so we just completed a, a study of 3,000 Generation Z, 15 to 22-year-old um, students. And we asked them about a bunch of different industries and what they were looking for in career and sort of how they saw their, their life and you know, really tailored to more in the high school um, age population, um, and so we can get into what to do with the younger kids in the in the pipeline. It's a little bit different strategy, but there there are some pretty alarming findings actually for construction. Of all the industries that we looked at, it was by far the lowest ranked. Sorry, Ryan, uh, the lowest ranked industry of interest um, when we when we we tested a lot of industries and also occupationally very low rank. And the reasons why were largely that the work is not being presented to them as something interesting and exciting. 
And this is an area where I think energy efficiency can actually play a strong role in driving people's interest into the sector. So when you start talking about maybe leave out the rats and the um, and the spiders and, and the itchy and, and the itchy right. insulation, but there there I think there are ways to talk about the energy efficiency sector and the types of careers that you can have, right? Maybe, you know, you've got to be honest about the entry level stuff, but a after you get past that, what that means in the career across a lot of different opportunities from building, uh, from building envelope construction work to design um, to many other elements of, of energy efficiency work in the, in the broader building space. And so I think that's one area where, you know, the faces of energy efficiency work I think is really interesting and I've thought a lot about how if those were the messages being delivered to high school students, I think you would find they would think those jobs are a lot more interesting than just, say, being an electrician or a general contractor, right? So I think that's a really positive opportunity. Also, both uh, millennials and Generation Z, they report really high interest in sort of doing social good with their work. And so the message, again, around energy efficiency, um, I think for, particularly for students who care about climate change, knowing that they can have a direct impact um, is, is, is also very important. The last thing I would talk about is, you know, if you look at pay and benefits, which is something that, you know, more and more students are concerned about taking on enormous college debt. And many of the jobs and the training that you get going through an apprenticeship program in the construction sector really from a skills perspective is absolutely the equivalent of the development, if not more so, than a four-year degree. And so, and the earning potential is there. So if you look at the, the earnings for a master electrician, it is pretty good across the country. Um, and you don't have to worry about the student loan debt. So these are, are sort of more societal and social ways of thinking about this, the, you know, what do people look for in work. Uh, the last thing I'll say is that and we do a lot of work with workforce boards and colleges and state policy directors who are pushing this top-down approach, which is find out what employers want, make that information available, and then everybody will rush to those opportunities. And that's just not how it works. So I think we need to spend a lot more time just generally in our education and workforce policy with kids finding out what's making them tick and what they want to do with their lives. And then really help employers to understand actually how they need to change if they want to attract the talent. because. At 3.8%, we're still acting like it's 2010, 2011, and everybody's begging for a job, and it's just not the case anymore. So, you know, maybe another recession will come and people will, you know, have, have the opportunity to find who they need. But, but as of now, if it keeps humming the way it's humming, um, employers need to start thinking about change. It's not my area of expertise, but I will take this opportunity to drop a couple of interesting facts. One is that the average single family home in the U.S. is 37 years old. That means there are a lot of homes that need to be upgraded. The average commercial building in the U.S. is 50 years old. So there's a lot of work. There was, an ana there was a tweet, so I don't give it a ton of, you know, attribution but said that at the current rate of the low-income work in Maryland, if we continue to invest in low-income weatherization in Maryland at the current rate, it would take 106 years to get to all of the low income. So it could be off by 20%. It doesn't matter. There's just an unbelievable amount of work that to be done in this area. Again, yeah, great question, I think. And to, to a couple of, picking up a couple of Phil and Pat's points, it's not just the, the, the job availability. It's attracting people to different, two different sectors within the efficiency space and energy space generally. And it's also the skills gap. So it isn't just a person. It's a person with the right skills, whatever that is. What the state energy office has been doing for a number of years now, and they've definitely stepped up and I think better targeted their work from the employment data that we've been working on is uh, putting that in the, so in, in secondary uh, education up to say sixth grade, Florida's a good example, they've been doing energy education kits in, in conjunction with their um, education department in local communities. We have 
really literally dozens of other states doing similar things. They have energy job fairs at like the state fair, if you will, uh, talking about efficiency, talking about renewables, talking about variety of energy sectors and the job availability. And I, and I would also point out there are a number of competitions that go on. Um, some of those are efficiency focused, some are renewables, some are conventional energy, but states are supporting those. There's the solar decathlon some of you may be familiar with. There's another one, we face a similar problem in the cyber workforce area for energy specifically. How do you get, how do you get cybersecurity experts in energy when they can have any job they want probably in any really beautiful, lovely place in the country, <laughs> all right? So there's a cyber force competition that the states and the Department of Energy um, are hosting, and it's to draw people into those, kind of the points that Phil made. What's interesting about that? What value and output does that have for the community, people they work with, their other attributes to it? So I do think it's those, uh, maybe, maybe some intangibles in addition to the, the income levels. Great, thanks. Go ahead, Brian. I think uh, as far as to your, to your question about where to start to engage the students, um, I got involved in a vocational program when I was in high school, and uh, specifically in, in the construction field of that. And I think that's a, a really good point. You're, you're working with your hands anyway. You have people who, who are kind of engaged with uh, the process of construction at that point. And this is really just a part of that. Um, and I think if you can see it in, in that fashion of this is just a part of building a better home, um, whether it's, it's the, the framing to the end um, process of actually putting in the aesthetic finishes, of a property, if, if you can see what will become the, the beautiful property that you've helped to build or helped to flip or whatever it is, um, maybe it's a little bit easier for people to get past some of the, the unpleasant uh, parts of, of the industry. Um, Um, I would just say, I would just add on to all of the wonderful answers um, given here, uh, volunteer opportunities. Um, uh, you know, I, I did Habitat when I was younger, not that that should, not that, you know, everyone can go through that particular program. Um, and that certainly taught me about being under houses and doing energy efficiency and the snakes and the bugs and everything as well. But there were some really important lessons um, and sort of, you know, I think for folks that are maybe a little bit, um, more geared towards working with their hands, it's an important lesson that like, oh, hey, there's this skill set that I've just unlocked that isn't like playing a video game or whatever kids are doing these days. Um, you know, and here's something that I, that I think that I can have sort of a purpose in. Um, and I'd also just say teachers need to talk to their lawmakers, local, state, and federal, um, about ensuring that this is in policies that are passed, that, that they're, you're educating in, in ways to talk to kids, to teach them about these opportunities. Um, that community, you know, there's community college outreach with schools, that, that there's resources available to have those sort of connections that are made. Yeah, thank you. Great. Um, other questions? Hello. So along the same lines of the pipeline question, um, in your opinion, are there being discussions had in the energy efficiency space around registered apprenticeships? Um, you know, using um, the, the avenues that we do have with DOL and Department of Ed to make sure that these pipelines are robust and that they are matching um, the growth. Happy to take a little bit of that. I, I will say that a number of our members are very engaged with their uh, state uh, labor departments and through DOL, so they're doing it through that avenue and those kind, that kind of coordination. The apprenticeship area is one that is of particular interest. I think we see um, in the, uh, whether it's the HVAC space or electricians, et cetera. I won't say it's uniform in every state. It depends a little bit on the market, but the, but the short answer is yes. And I think there's more of that can be done. Um, and, it, in, and that's the space that my sense is, it is more about policy and education and working with the private sector than it is about more money. But I, you know, not my area of expertise, but that's my sense. Go ahead, Pat. Um, we were just, uh, I was just interviewed actually for a, a piece that was done about an internship, internship program in Kentucky uh, for um, people who worked in the coal industry and um, g giving uh, an internship in the energy efficiency uh, business. Um, and there, so uh, I think that not only for uh, young 
people entering uh, the workforce, but there are a lot of skills that have been in industries that are maybe in decline where the skills with some, um, a little bit of assistance and a little bit of a, uh, help on. I think one of the things that's really challenging, and, and this isn't my, again, my area, these are really small businesses. You saw those, you know, they're really small businesses. So it isn't as if the businesses can always step up and do uh, all of the internships and, and so forth. So I think community colleges um, and other uh, assistants so that um, the small business person can get the, the person at the end of the internship uh, and, and be able to go forward. But I'd be happy to share that article with you. And just briefly, I think, you know, first, it's important to state, I think, that labor unions do an excellent job in preparing and training individuals already for these types of careers. The challenge is that, you know, the, the, capa the lack of capacity often that exists in terms and the waiting lists and other elements of actually getting into the union. So there's a few things to, to think about there. One is pre-apprenticeship. That's been done really successfully um, at a few community colleges in San Diego County, and it's... I will say a somewhat rare partnership between community colleges and labor unions. You know, they don't always get along all the time. So it's very beneficial to see that. Um, the other thing that I would mention is the Commonwealth of Massachusetts through the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center has for a number of years run a very successful internship program for clean energy businesses that, are, that was, has really been geared towards college students. And they are now rolling out a vocational program um, that will fully fund um, uh, full-time summer work for vocational students and students learning. So sort of like an apprenticeship slash internship model, but fully front funds at $16 an hour, the price of the, uh, of, of the apprentice, um, full-time for summer. So um, those are some innovative ways, I, I think, of, of broadening the pipeline that should be looked at as models um, that could be adopted in, in other places to sort of get to that. Um, that question that you have about using that apprenticeship model, because I do think it's it's proven to work. Terrific, and and as you were all saying, you know, I think part of it is also making sure that we talk about this so that people can see that it really does have an impact, and it's a way that you can really make a difference if you really care about social action and the kind of difference it makes for those issues and for people. Uh, just like your comment with regard to thinking about habitat. And, and how that all can make a difference, and as well as um, that there really can be really uh, well-paying skills that can be rewarded in terms of generating businesses. And perhaps also I was thinking about in terms of some of the manufacturers that are part of the supply chain for products that go into um, homes or businesses, that perhaps more of them could be thinking about kind of training or internship programs or whatever to help encourage um, small business development. And also, don't forget, too, that uh, every state uh, and many communities have, small, have their own small business councils or small business administrations. So that might be another good avenue, along with community colleges, to really start to do more and more outreach in this whole area. Other questions or comments? Kara? Uh, well, um, since we are here on Capitol Hill, maybe we could hear a little bit more about the um, incentives that could help to advance these energy efficiency programs um, that, that move things forward. Ryan, you're in Maryland. I know there's, a, there's some robust programs there. Uh, maybe you can explain how Empower or the other types of programs have helped to grow businesses, how incentives actually lead to jobs and that don't necessarily need incentives because then you keep having, job, having more jobs and growing the business. I think that incentive programs, rebate programs, um, they, they help to lessen the, um, the cost burden on the homeowner. Um, in Maryland, we have some of the, probably one of the best rebate programs in the country right now. Um, 
people can get up to 75 percent of a project cost reduced on making their home more energy efficient. So you have an energy audit done on the home, a work scope designed. You know what the estimated savings are going to be over a 10 to 14 year period. And then based upon those savings, you um, can receive a rebate for different individual measures that could be sealing the house, replacing the HVAC system, insulating it, conditioning a crawl space. Um, and so that, that helps to obviously cost burden, right? I mean, it's, you're, you're dealing with a homeowner. If there's not financing available um, for these things, which there aren't a lot of great financing programs for this type of work as say there are for things like kitchens or bathroom remodels. Mm -hmm. um, the state has a great program, but uh, aside from that, they're, they're kind of few and far between, so people don't have a lot of choices. Um, even though that you know, the, the whole idea of financing something like this is that if you have a $10,000 project and it helps to reduce your utility bill by $50 a month um, and the cost to pay off that loan for a, a 10-year increment is, is $100 a month, well, you know, the net is $50 on that, right? So, so it pays for itself over time. Um, but these programs, they talk about swelling a, a business. In the past, uh, in, this switched over in June of last year. Um, and since that time, my business has probably increased in the private market. I don't know exactly, but I'd say probably 30 to 40 percent. I mean, it's, it, it ballooned very quickly, and you can look at that on um, Delmarva Powers, Bee Genies, and Pepco's um, use of the program as well. I don't have those numbers. Um, but that also helps to, obviously, get more people out into it, more people know about it, they talk to their friends, oh, I got this great rebate, I had $15,000 worth of work done, and I paid 8500 for it. Um, you know, that kind of stuff gets the word out there. Um, it's you know, bad news travels much quicker than good news, so you have to have really good news uh, for it to get out there for people. And um, yeah, the, all of the money actually goes to the rebates too. It doesn't really go towards advertising of them. Just to, to follow up, I think Brian's comments are spot on, obviously. The one nuance I would add is I think one thing that our members have gotten better and better at over the last decade in particular is as they look at different parts of the market in their state, paying attention to those markets that uh, a low income disadvantaged, obviously needing weather assistance, assistance uh, grants and just straight up help. Um, another portion of the population that maybe can have a blended grant and loan program. The Nebraska Dollar and Cents uh, Energy Savings Program, which is operated through local banks and delivers very low cost efficiency loans that just a portion of the interest is subsidized by the, the state. And it's a revolving loan program that's, that's recycled for over 20 years, hundreds of millions of dollars in efficiency loans. So I think that kind of nuanced approach is important. And, and a, a second piece of that is that in the electric sector, with regulated uh, investor-owned utilities and an interest in uh, efficiency is almost always the lowest cost, best resource. The timing of when that efficiency delivers matters, matters, so we're getting more interested and sophisticated about how those incentives are applied, but there's a greater good. It's not just a, it's not just a handout. These aren't that kind of an incentive necessarily. They're to make the system, they're to optimize the system, make it run better. So I think that word incentive gets misinterpreted, especially in the utility sector. Um, this is about optimizing the system too. It's not uh, just about achieving a particular savings goal for some other purpose. It does a lot more than that. Sure. Okay. So um, specifically at the federal level, uh, tying into construction and renovation, we'd seen the 179D and 45A, I believe, uh, credits for commercial buildings and residential buildings that were that sunsetted in the last couple of years. And I haven't seen any figures on what sort of effect that's had on those markets, but I can't imagine that it hasn't had the sunsetting of those, hasn't had some sort of effect on them. Because those are really large federal incentives that are driving some of this growth, especially in producing more, you know, obviously renovating older commercial buildings or, or building new ones, and then, of course, um, building new residential buildings that are a little bit more efficient. Um, also, the weatherization assistance program at the Department of Energy. Um, oh, gosh, there's so many programs. The energy efficiency, <laughs> energy efficient building program um, at the Department of Energy as well. Um, I honestly could get you a long list. And the Energy Star 
appliance standards, which are mostly housed at um, the Department of Energy uh, for the moment as well, um, all of which have been um, slated for um, severe cuts, if not elimination, in the past few years. Um, those are, these are all real, real job growth policies, and they're pretty inexpensive. They're actually a very good deal for the American people. Go ahead, Pat. You wanted to say something? I was just going to say that um, the energy burden for low income uh, is really astounding. There are places in New Orleans, low income people spend more on their electric bills than they do on their rent. So it really does matter. And as the weatherization program comes up for re um, appropriations, it's very important. Um, and not only that, but you get to employ people in the community um, to do the work. So um, hope that you'll take a hard look at that program when it comes across your desk. And I would just add a piece of good news was that despite the requested cuts, that Congress responded and came back and funded things like Energy Star, weatherization, uh, recognize the value of that in the state energy program to say this is really, really important and we understand the difference that this makes to people at the state and local level. And coupled with that, to also pick up on what Ryan was saying, there's, there's also what's called the Rural Energy Savings Program through rural electric co-ops and we're doing a lot of work with those entities as well because they serve so many persistent poverty counties and that that is a way to provide um, because there are never enough dollars uh, to do all of the work to meet all of the needs but that that is a way for rural electric co-ops to be able to fund retrofits for people to be able to get services to improve their homes uh, and then pay for it on their monthly bills and end up with a positive cash flow even after paying off the, the payment. And it can make such a big difference as we talked about in terms of the um, quality of, of life, improving health, uh, as well as really reducing energy costs. So um, are there any last questions? We could take one more if there's otherwise I want to say thank you very, very much to all of you for all of those good suggestions and, uh, and for all of your thoughtful comments. And as we look to think about how do we do a better job building efficiency across the country and really allowing it to reach its capacity uh, that we really need uh, to meet the needs, um, we want to hear what those, what those efforts should be. So thank you all very, very much for coming and thank you again to our panel.